slope of the line would look something like this. If we were to come back in another billion years, the slope of the line would look something like that, and in another billion years would look like that. So it's, change, it's gradually changing in slope over time. And if we measure that slope, we can calculate the age. Okay. So six meteorites are both in the same So it means that it, it, it's, it's a good validation of, of the, um, the nebular hypothesis for the formation of the solar system. Right? <laughs> and again, the timing of that uh, formation of our solar system is, is like four and a half billion years, right? Which is considerably younger than the Big Bang. So we're talking about an event which happens once the universe is already 10 billion years old. And we know that our solar system formed from material that had once been in earlier generations of stars. How do we know that? It's got heavier elements. I mean, for one, it's got lead, and it's got uranium, right? Lead and uranium come from the inside of stars that went through a supernova phase, or maybe some other, a couple of other mechanisms uh, involving like neutron star collisions might be able to do things like that too. But yeah, the, the, the universe had been through quite a lot by the time our solar system formed, right? That's one of the things we can get from the chemistry of, of the solar system. Okay, so similar diagram, this is almost the same diagram, except that this is what you would call a modified isochron diagram. They flipped a bunch of the ratios and <coughs> changed exactly what's being plotted here. I just put this up because this is a um, this is the plot from the paper that dated the calcium aluminum inclusions in chondrites, right? That I mentioned uh, last week or earlier this week. Okay. It's again, it's a diagram of lead isotope ratios, and the idea is that if you plot multiple samples from the same material with different uranium lead ratios, you can get an age based on the slope. So the age that they get here, 4, 5, 6, 8 million years, so 4.568 billion years. Okay, and that reflects the age of a bunch of different <coughs> calcium aluminum inclusions in these chondrites. So that's the oldest thing that's ever been measured at all. And is probably the oldest thing that we ever will measure unless we capture one of these asteroids from some other part of the galaxy that happens to be coming through our solar system and we grab it. Maybe that's older, maybe not. That would be kind of fun. Um, maybe someday. But all the stuff in our solar system, basically this is the starting point. Yeah. So if we yeah. <coughs> Good question. Right. So the, the, the question was, if we're talking about calcium aluminum inclusions, where does uranium and lead come from? So uranium is almost always, with a few exceptions, present as a trace element in minerals, which means that you know every mineral has got a tiny little bit of uranium in it. Okay, so even though they're calcium aluminum inclusions, they have a little bit of uranium in there to begin with. And that's good, because if they didn't, you wouldn't be able to date them. All right? Yeah, good, good point, good question. Okay, anything else? Any other questions? Okay, so what I want to do next is I want to summarize everything that I think we know about the Hadean Earth. All right? That is, Earth in its first 500 million years of formation. And it's not, honestly, a very long story, because all we have to work with are meteorites, which actually aren't from Earth, although they have something in common with Earth, and a couple of dozen surfaces, <coughs> which have been dated, that are older than 4 billion years old. Okay, okay so here's what we think we know. Um, so the Hadean, and sometimes referred to as the geological dark ages, right? Nice compliment to the dark ages of CC 101, right? We're doing dark ages in CC 101? We skipped them. We skipped them. <laughs> because there's nothing to know, right? So we could probably have skipped the Hadean. Uh, I could probably go through the whole Hadean in just a few minutes, which is what I'll do. Okay, so the Dark Ages, it's, it's, uh, it's a part of, of geologic time about which uh, we are intensely interested, but we have very limited ability to, uh, to learn much. 
And so basically 4.568 to 4 billion years ago, remember that the oldest like chunk of crust that we've been able to find is just a little bit older than 4 billion years old, right? So that's not quite Hadean. You don't really have anything left from Hadean except these couple of mineral grains, a couple of zircons, right? So here's our geologic map of, of the Earth's surface again, showing ages of old rocks. Just a couple of slices where we find anything older than 3 billion years. Um, if I showed places where you could um, find rocks older than 4 billion years, it would be one tiny little dot in uh, northern Canada. That's it. There's a couple of other places in Greenland where you can find rocks that are not quite 4 billion years old, but there's just not much, not much left. So what do we know? Okay, so one of the things we know is if we accept these, uh, this nebular hypothesis for the formation of our solar system, we can create computer-based mathematical models of how a solar system would form and apply that to our own situation. And based on that, we can predict that this period of accretion starting with the formation of the calcium, aluminum, and inclusions that ultimately go on to be accreted into chondrites lasts about 10 million years, right? So from the time when we first start getting solid matter and what will become our solar system to when we basically have a sun and a bunch of newly formed planets, pretty quick, 10 million years, you know, over the course of four and a half billion years, that's pretty quick, right? So we pretty quickly have segregated out the matter into the sun and the planets. Although that early solar system is going to stay a fairly violent place for, for quite some time, as we'll see. Um, so we have a moon forming event. It has to be before 4.46 billion years old, billion years ago. How do we know that? <coughs> That's something we actually know, yeah. Exactly, right? So we get lunar and orthocytes that date to 4.46 billion years old. So that tells us that by that time, 100 million years after the formation of the initial formation of the solar system, we've got a moon and it's been around long enough that it's starting to crystallize a crust. There's some independent evidence that actually is described briefly in your textbook, if you're interested, that pins down the formation of the, uh, the moon <coughs> perhaps, right, based on the timing of the formation of Earth's core and all this kind of stuff. So maybe as early as 4.51 billion years, but certainly by 4.46 billion years. What else do we know? Okay, Earth's core, if we accept the giant impact hypothesis, and there's a lot of, a lot of uh, qualification here in, in our understanding of the ADN, right? So if we accept the, the giant impact hypothesis for the formation of the moon, that has to be, uh, the Earth's core has to have, have formed before the moon, right? Because again, the moon doesn't have an iron-rich core. It's all rocky material, okay? So we know that that happened. Um, we know that we've got some solid rock maybe related to continental crust material, like this kind of stuff, dating back as early as 4.404 billion years ago. Okay, now where does that come from? That comes from the <coughs> zircons. Okay, there are some problems with that hypothesis, right? It's true that if I were to take this rock apart and pick through the minerals, I would find lots and lots of tiny little zircons in it. Okay. All crustal rocks have lots and lots of tiny little zircons in them. But you can make zircons in ways that are independent of uh, continental crust. You can actually make zircons if you have a big enough meteorite impact smashing into basaltic type rocks. You can make zircons that way. So it's possible that those zircons we find in those really old rocks don't have anything to do with the crust. Right? The chemical characteristics, the details of those uh, zircons arguably suggest <laughs> that they came from continents. I'll show you a little bit more on that in a second. Those zircons have been really, really intensely studied. 
Oh, here it is, actually. So letters to nature. Nature is one of the two real high profile um, primary scientific literature journals that scientists from all fields publish in. Anybody know what the other one is? Science? Right, so science is, is, a, is a publication from the US. Uh, nature is, is a publication from, um, from Europe. And um, they tend to publish very, very high profile research. So getting a paper published in Science or Nature is a real feather in your cap. something that a lot of scientists spend a lot of time uh, pursuing. So this is Simon Wilde's uh, Nature paper, and as I mentioned, it came out of his PhD thesis, which again was kind of a big deal, you know, and he got a nice job out of this, and like, that's how academia works. Um, but look, look at what it says. Read the title. Evidence from detrital zircon. So what does detrital mean? Detrital means it's detritus. It's stuff that accumulated in a bunch of sands. Right? So we call these detrital zircons because they're, they're zircons that are found in rocks that weren't the rocks that they originally crystallized in. They were part of sediment. You could call them sedimentary zircons if you wanted to. Evidence from detrital zircons for the existence of continental crust and oceans on the Earth 4.4 billion years ago. Okay, so what they did with these zircons is they took the zircons and they measured the composition of the oxygen present in those crystals. Right? Looking at the relative amounts of heavy oxygen 18 and light oxygen 16. And the argument that they made was that the oxygen in the zircons, the oxygen isotopes in the zircons, are different than the oxygen isotopes in most rocks that you find in Earth's mantle, which is true, it's indisputably true, right? You have a big difference between oxygen isotopes in these zircons that you do in in um, in Earth's mantle. And one way <coughs> you might explain that is that one way to change the oxygen isotope ratios that you find in rocks is to have them uh, have the rocks interact with water, chemical reactions involving water. The oxygen in the water exchanges with the oxygen in the rocks at low temperature. You can imprint that those reactions in the oxygen isotopes in the minerals. And so the argument was that the zircons crystallized from a magma that had at one point um, <coughs> had rocks in it that interacted with water at low temperature. And from that they concluded that they were oceans on the Earth 4.4 billion years ago. Kind of a stretch. Um, but, it, it, you know, I was thinking about this. So I, I don't know who to attribute this quote to, but there's this idea that when you make extraordinary claims, you have to have extraordinary evidence. And it seems like for, for Precambrian geology, and particularly for Hadean geology, there's so little data that you can make up these, these really kind of reachy stories based on very few observations. And as far as I know, I mean, this, this paper has been critiqued a lot. There are alternative explanations that don't require either continents or oceans. But some people find this pretty convincing. Okay? So it's possible that we can interpret <coughs> these ancient zircons as evidence for the early Earth having, uh, having both continents and at least some kind of liquid water at the surface. 4.4 billion years ago, I mean, that's within 150 million years of the formation of the solar system. Yeah? So they say All they really can say is that there are continental type rocks present, right? Don't have any idea how big the continents would have been. But I think they would argue that since you find the remnants of those, they were probably, you know, the continents were probably pretty extensive. And that's one of the things that, that people argue about a lot in, in, in geology of the early Earth is, is when did Earth develop the continents? Because when we look at that map of the continents, we find that there, there are hardly any rocks that are older than three billion years ago. And so the question is, were there continents that are much older than that? And if there were, where did they go? Right. And there are answers to those questions. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So another interesting thing about the early solar system 
We don't find much evidence for this on Earth, although, although there is some. Um, if you look at a map of the moon, you find that it's all covered in craters. And based on the ages of moon rocks that were collected from the Apollo samples, you can actually put together a chronology of impact events on the moon. You can tell when in the history of the solar system a lot of these impacts happen based on whether lava flows that have been dated are smashed by craters or whether lava flows that have been dated are partially covering craters. And when you do that, you find that there seems to be <laughs> unusually high frequency of cratering events right here at about 4 to 3.9 billion years ago. Okay? So this is meteorite flux, which is basically frequency of meteorite impacts <coughs> versus time. And again, this is mostly based on lunar chronology, but we figure that it probably applies to Earth as well. So very, very early in the solar system, the solar system is just filthy with, with objects floating all around, smashing into everything. And there's kind of a, an exponential decrease in the frequency of meteorite impacts over the first half billion years. And then right at the end of the Indian, there's apparently, and I've seen some papers recently arguing that this, the statistics of this don't really hold up, and maybe there actually wasn't a late heavy bombardment, but it's pretty well accepted by, by most people that this is real. So we have this cataclysmic bombardment, increase in, in meteorite impacts, and that's referred to as the late heavy bombardment. Why late? Because it comes after the early part of heavy bombardment. Why heavy bombardment? Well, because there's a lot of meteorite impacts happening then. And we can't actually find any evidence of this on Earth because we don't have any crust from the Earth that's this old. But when we look at the surface of the moon, the moon has lots and lots of impacts that seem to date to this period, suggesting that uh, that Earth was probably bombarded at this time too. Yeah. So, excellent question. So, yeah, the question is, is there any reason why uh, why there should have been a cataclysmic bombardment at this point in the history of the solar system? I don't know. Maybe we should ask an astronomer. <laughs>
um, or the following, <coughs> what that evidence is. It's a little thin. It's, it's based on isotopes in the same way that the evidence for an ocean and the zircons was based on isotopes, but it's kind of all you have to work with, based on carbon isotopes in this case. And so what, one of the arguments that gets made is that once the late heavy bombardment was over, Earth was ready to support life, and it immediately supported life. It's also possible that there was life on Earth prior to the late heavy bombardment, but then got annihilated and life reestablished. We, we just don't know. And, and the reason I say this is a little suspicious is because we have like a handful of rocks that are even older than 3.8 billion years old. But what is at least supported by some evidence is that the oldest rocks that we find that are remnants of our crust have at least indirect evidence that there was something alive on Earth at the time. And I don't mean like lemurs or primates or really even algae. We're talking in most cases about, well, all we have are evidence that something that may have resembled what we know as life now was manipulating carbon. Okay. Any questions about that? We'll, we'll, we'll come back to this question of life. We're, we're sort of building towards this question of life, which is a very clever way that we've designed the course. Because uh, once we establish uh, the very early history of life on Earth, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Stevens, who's going to start talking about how early life uh, evolved from a biological perspective. Um, okay. So uh, another related question, which again is uh, something that there's been a fair bit of work on, but which there are really no super clear answers, is where did the ocean and atmosphere come from, and when did uh, Earth get an ocean and, and atmosphere? And, and in one sense, you know, if we ask Simon Wild, at least if we had asked him in 2001, when did Earth get an ocean, he would have said, well, my zircons are telling me that there was an ocean on Earth at 4.4 billion years old. Okay. Well, again, it's kind of, you know, we don't have very much data, right? So it's, it's kind of a hard question to answer. But one of the things, one of the observations that we can make about the ocean and the atmosphere is that the ocean is only 0.02% of Earth's mass, and the atmosphere is only 0.001% of Earth's mass. So what does that mean? Well, it means that the processes that result, that produce the, the solid Earth, the bulk of Earth's mass, don't necessarily have to be the same processes which account for the ocean and the atmosphere. Right? The ocean and atmosphere are really pretty, in terms of, of the total mass of the Earth, pretty insignificant fractions of the total mass of the Earth. They could have easily been added later by some other process. Right? So most of the mass of the Earth is chondritic <coughs> material getting together, ultimately getting hot enough to melt and differentiate. Does that also produce the ocean and atmosphere? Maybe. Or maybe there's more to it. And, and we can kind of look at what some of the lines of evidence are. One of them is this. Okay. We have in our solar system this concept that inside of a sort of hypothetical frost line, the planets accreted from material which was largely ice-free and thus largely dry. Okay? So if we're a planet that's inside of the frost line, right, we accrete from silicates and metals, why is there all this water on our planet? Where did it come from? Right? the chondrite material that formed our planet should have been pretty dry. Because ice wasn't condensing that close to the sun in the early solar system. So one idea was that we have comets. All right, we know that we have comets in our solar system. They're out here somewhere really far away, and they occasionally, well, regularly actually, come in, swing close to the sun, and go back out to the Oort cloud where they live. And one idea is that occasionally these comets intersect with our Comets are loaded with water, right? They are made largely of ice, among other things. And 
those could have been added over time to Earth and deliver its water. Um, so that's been, a, been sort of a popular theory. Um, one of the problems is that if you actually measure, again, this depends on isotopes, so if we measure the isotopes of hydrogen in comets, and this is deuterium to hydrogen, so that's high, regular hydrogen, um, this is one, this is hydrogen with an extra neutron, deuterium. Terrestrial water has a really different ratio of deuterium to hydrogen <coughs> than comets do. And it suggests that most of the water on Earth didn't actually come from comets, which is a problem for the comet hypothesis. It looks like the water that we find on Earth is actually similar to the water isotopically that we find in chondrites. Right, so those chondrites actually have hydrous minerals in them. They contain small amounts of water. So it's possible that Earth's water may have been delivered from objects out beyond the frost line that later came in again to Earth and added water. So it, it kind of looks like we have to add the water to Earth after its initial accretion and formation. And it's a question of whether that water came from comets or some kind of chondritic material from the asteroid belt. Evidence points to asteroid belt in that case. Okay, we can ask a similar question of the atmosphere. Okay. And, and ask again whether Earth's atmosphere is primordial. That is, does it reflect gases that were present <coughs> in the pre-solar nebula and the chondritic material that formed the sun? Or was it added <coughs> later by some other unknown process? And the thing that we can look at there is not so much isotopes, but the ratio of two gases nitrogen and neon. Okay, Earth's atmosphere, as I think you guys know, is loaded with nitrogen. Okay? The sun's atmosphere's got some nitrogen in it, but it's got just as much neon in it. Alright? And so the question is, so Earth's nitrogen and neon atmosphere in our atmosphere is like 86,000. Right? And the question is, if Earth started with the same amount of neon as nitrogen, it should still have this, this nitrogen and neon ratio as the sun. But it's got this really, really different, really nitrogen rich, really neon poor atmosphere, which suggests that our atmosphere was derived from some other later process. Again, we don't really understand the details of it, but it's probably not just degassing of chondritic material to form our atmosphere. So probably the Earth melted, differentiated, a bunch of gas went into the atmosphere, it was lost to space, and we accumulated nitrogen from some other process along the way. Okay, so Earth's atmosphere is probably secondary, derived from a combination of later outgassing from volcanoes and maybe late accretion from asteroids and comets. Um, last thing I want to show you, and then we'll stop for today. <coughs> is um, some data that's new that bears on this question. And this is actually something that I saw at a talk at, at a geochemistry conference uh, just last month in Boston when a French uh, scientist named Bernard Marti uh, came to Boston and reported results from an experiment that he had been involved with with the European Space Agency who rendezvoused uh, a spacecraft with a comet <coughs> a couple years ago and um, measured the isotope ratios of rare gases that were basically melting out of this comet. And what they did was they took the spacecraft and they put it in orbit around the comet, a few kilometers away from the comet, and deployed a mass spectrometer on this spacecraft and just sucked <laughs> up the gases that were being melted off the comet and measured the isotope ratios of this weird rare gas xenon. And based on that, they found that the, um, the xenon in comets, at least this comet, bears some resemblance <coughs> to Earth's atmosphere, to the xenon, which is a trace gas in Earth's atmosphere. But 
it's still pretty different. So he said that comets could contribute a maximum of like a quarter of the xenon in Earth's atmosphere, and the rest is probably chondritic. And we don't really care about where the xenon in Earth's atmosphere came from. We really want to know like where the nitrogen came from. But understanding the source of a rare gas like xenon might help us understand where the rest of the atmosphere comes from. That's why they do this experiment at great expense. Okay, so it suggests that our atmosphere is some combination of small amounts of cometary material plus lots of chondritic material, and it's largely secondary. Okay, so that, that's all I, I have for, for today. Um, we will um, be meeting tomorrow in your discussions, your Friday discussions. Uh, I'm going to assign a homework that will be posted tonight and will be due next Thursday. Um, and we, we have yeah, there's no class on Tuesday because Tuesday is a Monday schedule. So I'll see you all next on Thursday. Today. No love next week.